digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean, rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father, digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade. Just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf. Digging. The cold smell of potato mould, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. An Advancement of Learning I took the embankment path, as always deferring the bridge. The river nosed past, pliable, oil-skinned, wearing a transfer of gables and sky. Hunched over the railing, well away from the road now, I considered the dirty keeled swans. Something slobbered curtly, close, smudging the silence. A rat slimed out of the water and my throat sickened so quickly that I turned down the path in cold sweat. But God, another was nimbling up the far bank, tracing its wet arcs on the stones. Incredibly then, I established a dreaded bridgehead. I turned to stare with deliberate thrilled care at my hitherto snubbed rodent. He clockworked aimlessly a while, stopped, back bunched and glistening, ears plastered down on his nobbled skull, insidiously listening. The tapered tail that followed him, the raindrop eye, the old snout, one by one I took all in. He trained on me. I stared him out, forgetting how I used to panic when his grey brothers scraped and fed behind the hen coop in our yard, on ceiling boards above my head. This terror, cold, wet-furred, small-clawed, retreated up a pipe for sewage. I stared a minute after him. Then I walked on and crossed the bridge. The Early Purges I was six when I first saw kittens drown. Dan Taggart pitched them, the scraggy wee shits, into a bucket. A frail metal sound. Soft paws scraping like mad. But their tiny din was soon soused. They were slung on the snout of the pump, and the water pumped in. Sure isn't it better for them now, Dan said. Like wet gloves, they bobbed and shone till he sluiced them out on the dunghill, glossy and dead. 
Suddenly frightened for days, I sadly hung round the yard watching the three sogged remains turn mealy and crisp as old summer dung. Until I forgot them. But the fear came back when Dan trapped big rats, snared rabbits, shot crows, or with a sickening tug pulled old hens' necks. Still, living displaces false sentiments, and now when shrill pups are prodded to drown, I just shrug. Bloody pups. It makes sense. Prevention of cruelty talk cuts ice in town, where they consider death unnatural. But on well-run farms, pests have to be kept down. Midterm break. I sat all morning in the college sick bay, counting bells, knelling classes to a close. At two o'clock, our neighbours drove me home. In the porch, I met my father crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride. And big Jim Evans saying it was a hard blow. The baby cooed and laughed and rocked the pram when I came in, and I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand and tell me they were sorry for my trouble. Whispers informed strangers I was the eldest, away at school, as my mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry, tearless sighs. At ten o'clock the ambulance arrived with the corpse, stanched and bandaged by the nurses. Next morning I went up into the room. Snowdrops and candles soothed the bedside. I saw him for the first time in six weeks. Paler now, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. He lay in the four-foot box as in his cot. No gaudy scars. The bumper knocked him clear. A four-foot box. A foot for every year. For the commander of the Eliza. The others, with emaciated faces and prominent staring eyeballs, were evidently in an advanced state of starvation. The officer reported to Sir James Dombrain, and Sir James very inconveniently, wrote Routh, interfered. Cecil Woodham Smith, The Great Hunger. Routine patrol off West Mayo, sighting a rowboat heading unusually far beyond the creek, I tacked and hailed the crew in Gaelic. Their stroke had clearly weakened as they pulled to, from guilt or bashfulness I was conjecturing when, oh my sweet Christ, we saw piled in the bottom of their craft six grown men with gaping mouths and eyes bursting the sockets like spring onions in drills, six wrecks of bone and pallid tautened skin, be a, be a, be a. In whines and snarls, their desperation rose and fell like a flock of starving gulls. We'd known about the shortage, but on board they always kept us right with flour and beef. So understand my feelings and the men's, who had no mandate to relieve distress, since relief was then available in Westport though clearly these poor brutes would never make it. I had to refuse food. They cursed and howled like dogs that had been kicked hard in the privates when they drove at me with their starboard oar, risking capsize themselves. I saw they were violent and without hope. I hoisted and cleared off. Less incidents, the better. Next day, like six bad smells, those living skulls drifted through the dark of bunks and hatches, and once in port I exorcised my ship, 
reporting all to the Inspector General. Sir James, I understand, urged free relief for famine victims in the Westport sector and earned tart reprimand from good Whitehall. Let natives prosper by their own exertions. Who could not swim might go ahead and sink. The Coast Guard, with their zeal and activity, are too lavish, were the words, I think. Cow in calf. It seems she has swallowed a barrel. From forelegs to haunches, her belly is slung like a hammock. Slapping her out of the byre is like slapping a great bag of seed. My hand tingled as if strapped, but I had to hit her again and again and heard the blows plump like a depth charge far in her gut. The udder grows. Windbags of bagpipes are crammed there to drone in her lowing. Her cud and her milk, her heats and her calves keep coming and going. Docker. There in the corner, staring at his drink, the cap juts like a gantry's crossbeam, cowling plated forehead and sledge head jaw. Speech is clamped in the lips vice. That fist would drop a hammer on a Catholic. Oh, yes, that kind of thing could start again. The only Roman collar he tolerates smiles all round his sleek pint of porter. Mosaic imperatives bang home like rivets. God is a foreman with certain definite views, who orders life in shifts of work and leisure. A factory horn will blare the resurrection. He sits strong and blunt as a Celtic cross, clearly used to silence and an armchair. Tonight the wife and children will be quiet at slammed door and smoker's cough in the hall. Twice shy. Her scarf a la Bardot in suede flats for the walk she came with me one evening for air and friendly talk. We crossed the quiet river, took the embankment walk. Traffic holding its breath, sky a tense diaphragm, dusk hung like a backcloth that shook where a swan swam, tremulous as a hawk hanging deadly, calm. A vacuum of need collapsed each hunting heart, but tremulously we held as hawk and prey apart, preserved classic decorum, deployed our talk with art. Our juvenilia had taught us both to wait, not to publish feeling and regret it all too late. Mushroom loves already had puffed and burst in hate. So cherry and excited as a thrush linked on a hawk, we thrilled to the March twilight with nervous childish talk. Still waters running deep along the embankment walk. Poem for Mary Love, I shall perfect for you the child who diligently potters in my brain, digging with heavy spade till sods were piled or puddling through muck in a deep drain. Yearly I would sow my yard-long garden. I'd strip a layer of sods to build the wall that was to exclude sow and pecking hen. Yearly admitting these, the sods would fall or in the sucking clabber I would splash delightedly and dam the flowing drain. But always my bastions of clay and mush would burst 
before the rising autumn rain. Love, you shall perfect for me this child whose small imperfect limits would keep breaking. Within new limits now, arrange the world within our walls, within our golden ring. Storm on the island. We are prepared. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slit. This wizened earth has never troubled us with hay, so, as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost, nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale, so that you listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. Where there are no trees, no natural shelter, you might think that the sea is company exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat turned savage. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. In small townlands, for Colin Middleton. In small townlands, his hog's hair wedge will split the granite from the clay till crystal in the rock is bared. Loaded brushes hone an edge on mountain blue and heather gray. Outcrops of stone contract, outstared. The spectrum bursts, a bright grenade, when he unlocks the safety catch on morning dew, on cloud, on rain. The splintered lights slice like a spade that strips the land of fuzz and blotch. Hairs clean as bone, cruel as the pain that strikes in a wild heart attack. His eyes, thick, greedy lenses, fire this bare bald earth with white and red, incinerate it till it's black and brilliant as a funeral pyre. A new world cools out of his head. Personal Helicon for Michael Longley. As a child, they could not keep me from wells and old pumps with buckets and windlasses. I loved the dark drop, the trapped sky, the smells of waterweed, fungus, and dank moss. One in a brickyard with a rotted board top. I savored the rich crash when a bucket plummeted down at the end of a rope so deep you saw no reflection in it. A shallow one under a dry stone ditch, fructified like any aquarium. When you dragged out long roots from the soft mulch, a white face hovered over the bottom. Others had echoes give back your own call with a clean new music in it, and one was scarcesome. For there, out of ferns and tall foxgloves, a rat slapped across my reflection. Now to pry into roots, to finger slime, to stare, big-eyed Narcissus, into some spring is beneath all adult dignity. I rhyme to see myself, to set the darkness echoing.